911, the address of your emergency. Okay, and the phone number you're calling from. Tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Said he had just came from a neighbor's house, and we know there's been problems at this neighbor's house. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry, and he's thirsty. And he asked us to call the police. What's so he's very afraid. Okay, this boy has been... <laughs> this kid has obviously been... He's been detained. He's been... He's obviously covered in wounds. Are the neighbors out of their home, or is anybody looking for them that you can see? I'm not sure. How did you get out of the house? He says he just left through the porch at the neighbor's house. Her name is Jody Hildebrand. It's a call to 911 that changed a family's life forever. Ruby Frankie, a popular YouTube family vlogger, and her former therapist turned business partner Jody Hildebrandt, ultimately arrested for multiple felony counts of aggravated child abuse against Ruby's 12-year-old boy and his 10-year-old sister. The women's lives collided at least three years ago, according to Ruby's family members, well after the mom found fame and fortune, showcasing what many would call a strict and religious-focused approach to parenting on the YouTube channel titled Eight Passengers. Her co-stars traveling through life, six kids, and husband Kevin. Court documents state a YouTube video filmed in Hildebrandt's basement published two days prior to the arrest showed the women who were present in the home and having knowledge of abuse, malnourishment, and neglect. Neither Ruby Frankie, 41, nor Jody Hildebrandt, 54, chose to speak to officers at the time of their arrest, according to court documents, though Jody did tell investigators the two children in her care should not be around other kids. Both requested to speak to their lawyers and exercise their rights to remain silent. Has he told you where his mom or dad are? I haven't asked him that. Do you know where your mom and dad are? Well, actually, I don't know where my mom is, but I do know where my dad is. He's not anywhere here. No, no, no. No worries. And is your mom around here? Have you seen her lately? No. He doesn't know where she is right now. Does he know his mom's name? What's your mom's name? Ruby Frankie. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also known as the LDS or Mormon Church, the Frankie life was available to anyone with access to the internet. Can you ask him if any other children were in the home he came from? Okay. Um, is there any other kids up at Jody's house? 10 and 14, and they're, they're still at this house. Are they tied up as well? Um, what's the uh, deal with, are they, um, are, are they being held? Are they, are they, do they have wounds on them as well? Nothing bad going on with us. Okay. Okay, so they're, they're able to walk around the house and everything? And, well, okay. He says everything's fine with him. Cream salt. Okay. He says he, uh, what's happened to him is his fault. That's, that's not a problem. That's, that'd be your Controversy struck the Eight Passengers channel after one of Ruby's teenage sons revealed a 2020 video that he had no room and was sleeping on a beanbag for seven months for pranking a sibling, pointing a BB gun at his face, 
and hanging them up by a basketball hoop. I've been sleeping on a beanbag. I've been sleeping on a beanbag since October. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave my room back like two weeks ago. Despite the video being presented in a lighthearted way, even getting a few chuckles from the mom and other siblings in the clip, online viewers expressed their dismay, with one even starting an online petition demanding an investigation into the issue. More than 15,000 people signed it. People flooded TikTok recounting the incident, pulling other clips from the channel, including one where Ruby recounted withholding lunch from her kindergartner who forgot it at home. The natural outcome is she's just going to need to be hungry. The husband and wife told Insider that the clips were taken out of context. After the couple began counseling with Jody, Ruby joined her therapist's business, Connections Classroom, in 2021. So everything in Connections is broken down into truth or distortion. It's not broken down into good or bad. According to the website, Ruby is listed as a certified mental fitness trainer who also creates content on social media channels focusing on empowering parents and children to live in truth. By August of 2022, Ruby separates from her husband, according to his attorney. Eight passengers stopped uploading videos after January 2023. At the time, the channel had more than 2.28 million subscribers. You wonder where I've been on my vlogs. You wonder why I left YouTube it's to save my kids. No amount of money. I, and I'm telling you, I was making millions. And I left it because my kids were being hurt. On the website's About page, Hildebrandt said that Connections is the solution for anybody experiencing feelings of pain relating to relationship problems, anxiety, fear, or depression. So I really encourage people not to use the words of, you know, this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. Instead, everything is looked at and scrutinized through the lens of truth or distortion. And that's why this is so powerful. He's very thirsty and... Uh... Need an ambulance? I don't think he needs an ambulance. I'll let the cops decide that, but his ankles are taped up and he won't tell us why. Okay. But he has duct tape around each ankle. Yeah, there's sores around them. I think there's a good chance he's been... Uh... He also said oh, and he has them around his ankles. I mean, his wrists as well. Okay. Let's get the paramedics headed over that way, okay? No, oh, that's a good idea, too. Court documents would later reveal that the duct tape was wrapped around the boy's wrists and ankles because the binding, which included handcuffs, cut into his skin, damaging the muscle tissue. Ropes were used to tie two sets of handcuffs together so his arms and lower legs were lifted off the ground. He was also tied to an adult or even weights. The things that I experienced while living with Jody, I experienced being tied, I experienced being duct taped, I experienced being blindfolded, I experienced uh, severe isolation, I experienced severe emotional, spiritual, and psychological abuse. It's not the first time Jody, as a therapist, has been accused of using duct tape or other unorthodox, what some would consider cruel punishment techniques on a child. I experienced um, the being told I, I, I shouldn't be around other people, being told that I was dangerous to be around. Um, I was, people were afraid of me to the point where I was afraid of myself. Jesse Hildebrandt told KUTV2 News they were subjected to torture at the hands of their aunt Jody as an underage teen. Jesse said their parents left them in Jody's care with no warning for nearly a year. I was forced to sleep outside in the snow. I was um, like I said, isolated for up to 12 hours a day. Um, if I, if someone wanted, if someone spoke to me directly, if I wasn't wearing duct tape on my mouth, um, I had to just stare at them and not respond because she also had systems of people that would re report back to her if I broke any of these rules. We need you. We love you. We know what power exists inside you. And we want you to be here. So please humble yourself. Become curious about what we're saying. Jesse explains how devastating it was to hear details about the arrest, given the similarities of abuse she detailed to police that were documented in a 2010 report KUTV2 News obtained. 
it's devastating because I went forward as well. I mean, I went to the police when I was 16. According to the report, Jesse told police they had their mouth duct taped to prevent them from talking, were forced to sleep outside, had restricted shower and bathroom use, wasn't in school, and was wearing the same clothes for three weeks. If in any rooms, Jesse said the doors had to remain open at all times. American Fork Police recommended the report forwarded to the Department of Child and Family Services. And I went, I, I tried to do what I could, and no one believed me. Because why would they? She destroyed my credibility. I was an angry teenager. And now I'm just so, oh, you're just like an emotional, angry teenager that, and she had told people that I destroyed my family's life, that I destroyed my dad's life, that every person I come in contact, I destroy. So she sets up the premise. And then when I come forward and try to tell people like, this is what's happening, she can be like, oh, see, Jesse's trying to destroy my life is what they do. It just all adds up. So she's so good at protecting those loopholes and discrediting people. A few weeks after that report was filed, Jesse ran away. Their Aunt Jody filed the report with American Fork Police, claiming Jesse likely fled because they did not want to go to a girls' juvenile program for troubled youth. Jesse was found a month later by police at a shelter in Salt Lake City. According to the report, they told officers they ran away from their aunt because they were forced to run and confess their sins calling it an attempt to break them down. Ruby's young daughter faced a similar punishment. She was also forced to run barefoot on dirt roads for an extended period of time, according to court documents. I just hope that this can give the public some context and some clarity of what is happening and why they should not believe her. Jesse believes their family left them in Jody's care because they considered Jesse a troubled teen which was an idea that they said was reinforced by Jody. Her whole thing, which is deeply, darkly ironic, is that everything is, stems from shame and how, how horrible shame is. And that all of the reason, like all of mental illness, all um, tics, so like OCDs, addiction, everything stems from shame, which is just horrifying because she is the greatest uh, perpetuator of shame. She accused me of being a sex addict. She accused me of being uh, addicted to masturbation to the point where I wasn't allowed to, I, I mentioned this on the podcast, to the point where I wasn't allowed to use tampons. Um, I never was allowed privacy unless I was isolated. So that included the bathroom. I was never allowed to have the door closed because she was convinced that I was just constantly masturbating. She was convinced that I was addicted to porn. Um, I had never seen porn at that point in my life. I, I'd never, I didn't even know that people with <laughs> my anatomy could masturbate. Like I, I had no idea any of this stuff, but I just believed her. The accusations of addiction to porn were echoed by Ruby against her own son, who escaped to a neighbor's house and asked for police. According to the Daily Mail, in the first custody hearing over the mom's four minor children, Ruby claimed one child began looking at porn nearly 10 years ago when they were only three years old. She also claimed the child sexually abused other children, providing no evidence of this at the hearing. Jesse finds it haunting to think her Aunt Jody wielded such influence over Ruby and her children. To hear Ruby tell the world that her child is a sex addict, a predator, and has been addicted to porn since he was three years old, it just echoes exactly the things that she was telling me and telling everyone around me. It's been a really interesting experience watching everyone focus on Ruby, and I understand why. But this is Jody. These are Jody's words. These are Jody's ideas. These are over decades old. It was just so directly similar. I mean, the exact thing. This is exactly what she does. This is what Jody does. And so now, because she's painted him as this thing, regardless of what comes out, like he's no longer, I mean, I think. Hopefully the public can see through this and the judge can see through this. But that's the, that's the goal is so that anything that he says is now no longer credible. Jesse's Mormon faith that they shared at the time with Jody, they say was also weaponized and used as a form of control. It was a detail Ruby and Jody admitted to in court documents. Both said they were convinced the children that they were evil and possessed, that punishments were needed to show obedience and repent. She used religion and God as a mode of control. 
and I'm a, a mode to manipulate. And so I just believed all of these things. And I was a teenager. And so a child in that position of being told this over and over and over and over again, which I'm certain he was, um, stood no chance. Is that why you've called Jody the mastermind behind all of this? Yes. Um, that doesn't excuse Ruby's involvement and her pe perpetuating these, these beliefs and these systems. But Ruby didn't come up with this. Um, Ruby um, obviously supports it and um, has used these on her children. Um, but this is coming from Jody. She wanted to make my life so uncomfortable that it would force the sin out, that it would force me to confess. So things continuously got worse and worse and progressively more and more intense as a way to get me to confess because she believed that if I had confessed everything, if every all of my sins were out and in the open, that I would be getting better. And I was declining like very fast, exponentially. Jesse takes issue with Ruby's testimony reported by the Daily Mail during that first custody hearing, since they believe the child went through a similar hell. She's saying that he even confessed to it. Well, I also confessed to things that I didn't do as a way of trying to get the abuse to stop. Because when you when she's like drilling it into you both psychologically and physically that there's more and it will stop once you tell her because that's what that's what she would tell you like in the middle of the abuse she'd be like I'll stop as soon as you tell me. Jesse said Jody accused them of having an abortion and being addicted to drugs and sex, even putting them through a 12 step program, something that is traditionally followed at Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd never done drugs. I had never had sex. Again, I didn't know that masturbation was even possible. I had no idea what these things were. Um, so I would start, I just started making things up as a way as like trying to get this to stop because I had no no one there to, to help me. And when I spoke to the, de the detective um, down in um, St. George days ago, I told her that as well. It's like, I, and so even if he had confessed, it can it cannot be taken seriously because this child was being tortured. Some of the punishments inflicted on Ruby's son, forced outdoor labor without shoes, standing in direct sunlight for hours led to him suffering multiple sunburns with blistered and slothing skin. He was punished for sneaking a drink of water. When he was allowed to eat, he was given plain meals while other kids in the house were given more flavorful ones. He was isolated from others and denied access to books, notebooks, and electronics. What is happening it just echoes so close to home of what she did to me. They're coming to you as quick as they can, okay? Okay, yeah. yeah he's, to make sure. he's fine. He's like, got him sitting here. My wife, he got him water and something to give him something to eat because he's really, he's hungry and... Uh, like the young man, he's, had, he's here in his stocking feet. Uh, so he, he escaped. What is your relation to Ruby? Uh, she is my aunt. Um, she, uh, so my uncle Kevin, I'm related to by blood and uh, he married her. What do you make of this whole situation or at least when you first heard about all of what was going down and, and Ruby and Jody being arrested on child abuse allegations. But it's kind of like a train wreck that you can't look away from. I was um, a little bit stunned that someone that I was related to had just been arrested and made um, the national news. I am still kind of trying to understand how anyone and my family, whether they're directly related to me or extended, could could do that to their family. We haven't really seen Ruby for like 10 years. Matthew told KUTV2 News he's concerned with what he described as the influence Jody had on his aunt Ruby. Starting this group with my aunt that is um, really cultish from the sounds of it. Um, I think she should get put away for a long time. As far as my aunt, um, I think she definitely needs to do time. Um, I don't know what the future will hold for her if this was maybe just 
for being led down the wrong path. But Matthew Frankie said communication with his aunt through the side of the family was limited. According to Sisters of Ruby, though, they tried to foster a relationship with Ruby and her family of eight, but were cut off soon after she started working with Connections Classroom. Bonnie Holine, Ruby's sister, who also runs a YouTube family channel, initially published a video saying the arrest of Ruby and Jody was necessary. Bonnie said Ruby, her husband Kevin, and ultimately Jody and the Connections Classroom have been destroying our lives offline for the last three years. What my family and I have gone through the last couple of weeks is the worst thing that has ever happened to us. Ruby's sister, Julie Daru, who runs Daru Crew Vlogs on YouTube, also shared a video titled My Side of the Story Concerning My Sister, Ruby Frankie. Jody Hildebrandt and her website or therapy style, I don't know what you want to call it, connections, was not a great resource and we all saw it. Julie affirmed what her other sister, Bonnie, said. Ruby cut ties with family three years ago, around the same time she started working with Jody and Connections Classroom. Crap hit the fan and she left the family. Is Jody up there right now? Yes. Okay. Jody Hildebrand is up there right now. Okay. So she may come looking for him here soon, but uh, he's not going to, obviously. I think we need the cops here as soon as possible. I'm just asking where he is now. Yeah, she's a, uh, she's a bad lady. We didn't realize how bad. It isn't the first time Jody's character or methods have come into question. Sure While she voluntarily turned in her mental health counseling license in mid-September following her arrest, she did have it suspended once before for violating patient confidentiality. I was sent to uh, Jody Hildebrandt, yeah. but me and my wife together. Adam Steed has come forward, identifying himself as the person who was at the center of Jody's license suspension in 2012. KUTV2 News confirmed the Division of Professional Licensing suspended her license with limitations for 18 months. It was eventually reinstated. According to the suspension documentation, she was reprimanded because she discussed sensitive information about Adam and his wife with his LDS church leaders and two other mental health therapists without their permission, while both attended Brigham Young University, according to the licensing division's official documentation of the incident. Adam said he was recommended to go to therapy by his church leader known as a bishop. The bishop was saying it was for both of us as a couple. There's a lot of trauma here. Jody was found to have violated state law by contacting BYU Counseling Services and Adams LDS church leaders with privileged information. Therapists cannot share patient information without patient consent. They record in their writings the phone call where Jody Hildebrandt contacts them to talk about me. As a result, the church also dropped Hildebrandt from their family services referral list, according to a 2012 report filed by the Salt Lake Tribune. Adams said Jody destroyed his marriage, life, and career ambitions due to her actions that led to his dismissal from BYU, the private university operated by his church. I was sitting there with my baby who's hugging me and crying she hasn't seen me. And next thing I know, I got served a protective order, and I'll never forget her screaming, yelling, Daddy, no, Daddy, no, just screaming as this lady I don't know pulled her out of my hands, and then they hand me this restraining order against me. Adam isn't the only one who has come forward to criticize Jody's methods. Some people who participated in her connections program in Utah told KUTV2 News Jody's approach to counseling was problematic. It started to feel more and more evil. And I finally, in one of the group meetings, I got up and I just said, this is off. Trey Warner said Jody Hildebrandt would regularly use shaming tactics among clients looking for marital advice. He also said Hildebrandt was an expert in making people believe they were dangerous to be around. He recounted one fellow participant's story to KUTV2 News. There was a man that had a successful business that believed that he was a danger to his wife and his family because he did a double take as a woman. Like if he saw a beautiful woman, he, he would see and he'd look again. This guy got his own apartment and separated from his family because he was a danger. 
In some cases, Warner claimed husbands were separated from their families for so long, they were considering suicide. They felt so sick and like such a failure that they just felt like they shouldn't be here anymore. I saw Jody Hildebrandt with my ex-wife. Uh, we were married at the time and it was couples counseling. Bryce Della Rippett was advised by his bishop as recently as 2021 to go see Jody Hildebrandt for counseling services to help with his new marriage. His interactions happened over Zoom. The first thing that she wanted to ask about is um, before we even started talking about anything, she just goes, have you ever watched pornography? She was pretty obsessive of, about sexuality. It's kind of strange. It, just, it, it upsets me because I know that she has affected a lot of marriages and they've come to an end because of her. Her business connections classroom, is this the same approach she uses for all of her patients as well that are not family or not Ruby's kids, as um, you know? Uh, I I don't know the intricacies of what she promotes and what she teaches on Connections Classroom. Um, if it's anything in, even close, then I mean, I'm certain that there's going to be parallels. Um, I'm certain. I know that she believes that um, all shame should be punished. And I, I know that like that. I, so like I, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't I, I really don't know. I, I've stayed away as much as possible from her and her world um, to just heal and to try to salvage any life that I could possibly live um, post living with her. Why do you think it took to 2023 for a child to escape, go to a neighbor's house, call 911, and now this is a thing? Like, why did it take this long? Um, I think it's a combination of quite a few things. One, the church supports her. She's been promoted by the church and people trust the church. Members trust their bishops, they trust their stake presidents. And a lot of these people, most people that are going to therapy, if not all, are in a vulnerable position. And she is remarkably convincing. She is also terrifying if you cross her because she has and will systematically destroy your life. We have a culture of people not believing children and not trusting children. And also children trust their parents and then they, and the parents trust the church. So there's been, and, and Jody, what she does that's so terrifying is that she utilizes and uses whatever is available. So if you go to her with OCD, if you go to her with severe depression, she'll use that information as a way of control oh, you have OCD because you have deep-rooted shame. And she also separates people. She keeps people so they don't can't talk and corroborate. Like, it is it is so vile and tricky and ingenious. Jody is, <laughs> she is a very unwell person. You did get enjoy that banana, okay? Yeah. Yeah, he, he did the right thing. I mean, I want justice and I want fair justice. So I want everything that she has done, that both of them have done to be held accountable. Um, whether that be six, 12, 18, however many, um, I just want to see that she is held accountable for the things that she has done. Because, but I, I, I personally believe that that is not going to, that is not covering everything that she's done. And I can say that because I know that she's not being held accountable for what she did to me in, in the legal system, I mean. What do you think the public will ultimately take away from these two as it pertains to the court proceedings and such? I mean, I just, I just hope that Jody is not sidelined in this because she is so, so connected to what is happening. And yes, Ruby needs to be held accountable because she, is, she made those choices. She is just as, as, as guilty. Um, but Jody has been doing this for much longer and has has uh, patterns and history in this. Even though R Ruby's the focus, I just hope that Jody is not, um, that she's not able to slink away and just kind of fade into the background because she is, she is the foundation. This isn't something that I just believe in. I have watched thousands of people change.
All right, I've been handed a plea agreement and it appears to be signed by Ms. Frankie. Ms. Frankie, did you sign this agreement? Yes. And you did that today? When did you sign it? On the 18th. Okay. You've read it carefully? Every word. All right, then. Ms. Frankie, how do you plead to count one aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children. Guilty. Is anyone pressuring you to enter into this agreement or is anyone promising you anything that I haven't been told about or that is not in the written document? No. Then Ms. Hildebrand, how do you plead to count one aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. Thank you.